The Great Northern and City Railway, as it was then known, opened in 1904. Connecting Finsbury Park and Moorgate, it was an electrified line, which, except for a short open section here at Drayton Park, ran in tube tunnels of 16 feet in diameter. In 1913, the line was acquired by the Metropolitan Railway, who intended to connect it to the Circle Line. This never happened. Following the formation of the London Passenger Transport Board in 1933, the line became part of the London Underground System and was known as the Northern City Line. Operated by standard tube stock, the juxtaposition of small rolling stock, large diameter tunnels and high platforms gave the line a curiously out-of-scale appearance. It also suffered from a rather unusual musty odour. In the late 1930s, it was planned to connect the line to Highgate and the Alexandra Palace branch, a scheme known as the Northern Heights Extension. However, World War II intervened and the plan was stillborn. The Alexandra Palace branch itself closed to passenger traffic in 1954 and Highgate Surface Station remains unused to this day. In 1964, the Northern City Line was terminated at Drayton Park to make way for the new Victoria Line to utilise the platforms at Finsbury Park. Renamed the Northern Line Highbury Branch and operated by 1938 tube stock, the truncated branch soldiered on until, in 1975, its ownership was transferred to British Rail. The once isolated Northern City Line was finally connected to the national network and had trains that fitted the tunnels and platforms. In this short programme, we'll be examining in detail the arrangements for emergency response and evacuation, as well as the location and accessibility of emergency equipment. We'll also take the opportunity to look at the procedure for the evacuation of a passenger train in one of the tube tunnel sections. So let's begin here at Drayton Park Station. This station marks the boundary between the 25 kV overhead electrification and the 750 volt DC third rail. The platform lines are provided with both systems, the 750 volt DC starting at the north end and the 25 kV overhead ending before the tunnel portals at the south end. Both systems are live and it is here that the trains change from one system to the other. The first things we need to look at are inside this tall blue cabinet located halfway along the island platform. To open it, you'll need a carriage key. Inside is an extendable ladder, two short circuiting bars, a spare high visibility vest and a pair of insulated gloves in a sealed pack. These must be in date. The gloves are safe for use on up to 1000 volts. If you find the seal on the bag is already broken, the gloves are not to be used. Located at the south end of the platform are two grey headwall tunnel boxes, each containing the red emergency telephone and the red emergency plunger for traction current isolation. To open these cabinets, you'll need a BR1 key. The red emergency telephone gives direct contact to the signalling centre while depressing the red emergency plunger will isolate the DC traction supply from Drayton Park to Moorgate on the line which the cabinet faces only. It will also turn on the high level lights in the tunnel bore. If you need to isolate the power on both bores, you will need to operate both plungers. If a person should fall from the platform and come into contact with a conductor rail, you'll need to act very quickly. Get the current isolated by depressing the emergency plunger and the train stopped by an emergency call to the signalling centre. Once you have the assurance that these things have been done, you can then get down onto the track. Place the short circuiting bar in position and put on the insulated gloves before pulling the victim clear of the conductor rail. In the centre, between the two emergency cabinets, there's an unlocked accessible emergency telephone with keypad. This telephone does not give a direct line to the signalling centre. On each platform there's also a help point, which may be used by passengers to obtain service information, 
but which also has a green emergency button, enabling a passenger to report an emergency directly to the service delivery centre. On the southbound platform ramp at the southern end of the station, you'll find tunnel light switches. It may be necessary to switch on the tunnel lights in emergency, but do not assume that if the tunnel lights are on, the traction current is isolated. Always check with the signaller. Finally, if it is necessary to evacuate the station, you will normally utilise the exit steps leading to street level. If these are unavailable for any reason, you must gather people together and wait at the very north end of the platform and await the emergency services to assist. <laughs>this is Highbury and Islington station. It's the only station on the Northern City Line that has a London underground platform directly opposite each of the up and down lines of the NCL. These platforms serve the Victoria Line. On the southbound NCL platform you'll find the brown emergency cupboard containing the extendable ladder, one short circuiting bar, a spare high visibility vest and the sealed insulated gloves. In the adjacent red cabinet you'll find CO2 fire extinguishers and foam extinguishers which can only be used on fires where the electrical current does not exceed 110 volts. The doors to this cabinet are sealed. From the northbound platform in the cross passageway between the platforms there is another emergency fire cabinet containing CO2 and foam extinguishers as well as reeled fire hose. Again the doors are sealed. On the opposite ward of the cross gangway is a grey door marked with a green and white emergency sign. Open this door with a carriage key. Inside is an extendable ladder, one short circuiting bar, a spare high visibility vest and insulated gloves. On each tunnel head wall is a driver information sign which is normally covered by a flap. If for any reason the tunnel telephone wire system is not working the signaller will instruct the station staff to lower the flap to reveal the sign. On seeing this sign the driver must make a radio test call to the signaller via the cab radio. Adjacent to this sign is the brown headwall tunnel box containing the red emergency telephone and the red traction current isolation plunger. In the lower part of the cabinet is the tunnel light switch. To open these cabinets you'll require a standard carriage key. To the right is an unlocked yellow box containing plug-in points for portable telephones provided in the driving cabs. Only the top and bottom plugins, marked auto, may be used. These connections provide a direct line to the signalling centre, but you will need to punch in the internal number, which is printed in the inside of the box cover. These plug-in points are also located in the middle of each platform and at 100 yard intervals in each tunnel bore. Emergency evacuation of this station is, as indicated, via the normal passenger access to the escalators and then to the concourse at street level. Highbury and Islington, along with Old Street and Moorgate stations, are managed by London Underground, so it is vitally important that you follow the instructions of the LUL station supervisor when carrying out an emergency evacuation. If the station must be evacuated in an emergency, London Underground staff will ensure the gate line will be fully opened. The remaining underground stations on the Northern City Line, Essex Road, Old Street and Moorgate are provided with essentially identical emergency equipment, but with two short circuiting bars, ladder, high visibility vest and insulated gloves in the brown emergency cupboard which can be found on only one of the platforms at each of these stations. Each platform is equipped with a fire alarm, which may be activated by breaking the glass and depressing the button. Would Inspector Sands please go to the operations room immediately? 
Here at Essex Road, there is a spiral staircase for emergency evacuation, which can be located by following the green emergency exit sign. In the event of a fire at this station, the lifts will be taken out of service and evacuations will be via the emergency stairs only. The staircase leads to the booking hall at street level. The evacuation route at Old Street is much the same as that at Essex Road. Follow the green emergency exit sign to the spiral staircase, which at this station has 100 steps, and thence to street level. Moorgate Station has exactly the same arrangement. Just follow the green emergency exit sign. Finally, in all the underground stations, there are location markers on the passage walls. These can be used in emergency to advise the control centre of your precise location. When carrying out an emergency evacuation at any station, if anyone is encountered going against the flow, inform them that the station has been evacuated and they must immediately make their way to the emergency exit. If a station has been closed for any reason, the station staff must open the station closed indicator. If this indicator is displayed, drivers must, if possible, continue through to the next station. If the platform signal is at danger, the train doors must not be released. If the station closed indicator is displayed at Moorgate, the driver must change ends without releasing the train doors and depart from the station as soon as the signal displays a proceed aspect. In all situations, the driver must make a PA announcement to explain the circumstances to the passengers. <laughs> In this final section, we're going to look at the evacuation of a passenger train in a tube tunnel section. The first consideration must be the isolation of the traction current. Use the cab secure radio, or GSMR, to make an emergency call to the signaller. Request isolation of the third rail and gain permission to carry out the evacuation. If this isn't possible, open the left-hand cab door and pinch the two copper wires together, rubbing them to ensure good contact. Of course, you may have stopped adjacent to a pair of insulators, in which case you'll need to use the mini short circuiting bar. Place it firmly across both wires and rub the bar along the wires to ensure good contact. Now attach the clip on phone, rubbing the two clips along the wires to ensure good contact. Then press the red isolation button for five seconds. If you haven't already established communication with the signaller, you can use this clip on phone to do so by pushing and holding down the yellow button. In the very last resort, you can isolate the traction current by using the short circuiting bar. But remember, this will only isolate the section your train is standing in. If you still haven't made contact with the signaller, you could try the plug-in phone at one of the points within the tunnel bore. Remember, when applying the short circuiting bar in the Northern City Line tunnels, you must always turn away and cover your eyes. Now, let's go back and assume that you have obtained a traction current isolation via the cab secure radio, or GSMR. Fetch the short circuiting bar from the emergency cupboard and place it immediately ahead of your train. This is an essential protection against the conductor rail being re-energised by mistake. Place the short circuiting bar as close to the train as possible so that the emergency ladder can be placed over the top of it. This will ensure that it won't be dislodged by passengers evacuating the train. Now return to the driving cab and fetch the emergency ladder.
make sure it's firmly and securely attached to the gangway floor. Now you can begin to evacuate the passengers and lead them to a position of safety. Should a train need to be evacuated at Poole Street, it must be remembered that there is a gap in the third rail at this location and a gate allowing access between the up and down lines. Therefore, a short circuiting bar must be placed on each of the four live sections. There are four short circuiting bars in the equipment cupboard at Poole Street for this purpose. What we've looked at in this short film are the essential emergency procedures which are specific to the Northern City Line. Thanks for watching.